بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The Holy Eighth Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, is revered and respected around the world. He is the beacon of knowledge and the manifestation of guidance, the crystallization of modesty, as well as the embodiment of generosity, kindness, as well as the source of guidance for mankind. He was born in the holy city of Medina in the year 148 after Hijra. His father, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al Qadim, peace and blessings be upon him, was martyred by the Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Abbasi in the year 183 after Hijra. Of course, during this time, the Imam salam was in Medina. Thereafter, he enjoyed a relatively easier number of years whereby there was an opportunity to spread the knowledge of Ali Muhammad. In the first episode of this particular series, we described and talked about his attributes, his characteristics, the features about the life of Imam al-Ridha that drew people towards him. In this episode, we focus on the life of the great Holy Eighth Imam from him reaching the area of Tus all the way through to his martyrdom. Of course, Imam al-Ridha, peace be upon him, was forced to take the journey from the holy city of Medina all the way towards Khurasan or the land of Tus. There was a bitter struggle by the sons of Harun al-Abbasi. The Muslim world had seen over several years thousands killed in the struggle for the Caliphate. In this determination of Ma'mun to assume the leadership by force at the expense of his brother Amin. Of course, some of the Abbasids favored his brother Amin over himself. Why? Because Ma'mun was born from a slave girl, whereas Amin, his mother Zubayda, was well known and was an Arab. After assuming the caliphate from his father, Harun Amin started to challenge Ma'mun who had set up a some kind of counter government in Khurasan. The feud between Ma'mun and Amin was excessively violent. Thousands of people were killed. The battle raged on until Ma'mun surrounded Amin in his palace in Baghdad, killed those around him and eventually killed his own brother placing the head of his brother at the gate of the palace for the people to enter and send their curses upon him. Thereafter, Ma'mun established his caliphate in Khurasan, moving it from Baghdad. When Imam al-Ridha reached Khurasan, the town or city of Merv, Ma'mun called him to his palace. This time, Ma'mun had a plan. First of all, he welcomed Imam al-Ridha, praising him, saying he had a lot of admiration for him. But at the same time, he, had to, he said to him that I want you to accept to become the Caliph of the Muslims. Imam salam immediately said to him that I know your plans. I know that I will be killed here. Mamun said, by whom? Imam said, if I'm allowed to say, I would have said. Mamun said, then become the Caliph. Imam said, no. By God, I will not become what you want me to be. Ma'mun said, I am presenting it to you, Imam salam replied, by saying this khilafat that you are giving to me, is it yours? If it's being given to you rightfully, then you should look after it and you're not to give it to anyone else. And if it's not yours, what right have you got to give to me what is not yours? Faced with a difficult situation and scenario, Ma'mun moves to plan B. His plan was to force Imam al-Ridha to become the heir apparent. He says to him, you become my vice. But this time, Ma'mun al-Abbasi showed his true colors. He said to the Imam, if you do not do so, you will be killed. You have no choice, otherwise you'll be executed. 
Imam al said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded me to protect and look after my life and not to place it in danger. Therefore, I will do what you say, but for one condition, and that is, I do not appoint, I do not sack, I do not legislate, I do not take part in the main affairs of the government. The reason why al Ma'mun wanted Imam al Rada to be next to him and to make him the heir apparent was number one, to ensure that he can monitor the movements of the Imam. And number two, to give legitimacy to his own rule. Because at that time, there were many people calling for the rights of the Ahl al-Bayt And number three, to stop the Imam from calling for his own caliphate. al Ma'mun was waiting for this opportunity. The opportunity to declare to people that Imam al rida peace and blessings be upon him, had been appointed as the heir apparent, as the one who would become the caliph after Ma'mun. There were widespread celebrations in the city. Food was distributed. The color green was adopted. And indeed what happened thereafter was that the name of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam was printed on the special coins that were used at that time. Ma'mun did his best to ensure that people knew of this important development. A development by which he had orchestrated in order to serve his interests and the plan that he had drawn for his caliphate. During the time of Imam al-Rida in the city of Marb, in Tus, Khurasan, al Ma'mun al-Abbasi played a political attempt to try and somehow undermine the Imam. Some say, of course, that time was very much strife with the different ideological, theological schools of thought. People and scholars from different parts of the world were invited to come and to debate and to take part in discussions. There was, of course, the famous debate and the discussion surrounding the Quran and whether it was created or not. Likewise, we are told that Imam al-Rida alayhi salam in numerous occasions was invited to take part in these discussions, these debates with schools of thought, with other religions, faiths, as well as those who were faithless, atheists and so on. We have the famous companion by the name of Abu Salt al-Harawi, who was a individual, a knowledgeable individual at the time of Amr Rida. He would mention that I did not see anyone more knowledgeable than Ali ibn Musa Rida. He did not meet with anyone or debate with any individual or scholar, except that these people recognize the degree and the status of this individual, the knowledge that he had, and they acknowledged that they themselves were much less knowledgeable than Imam al rida alayhi salam. There would be a place by the name of Darul Hikmah in Marv, where Al Ma'mun would want to somehow undermine Imam al rida somehow wish that he, he would not be able to answer the questions of these people, these scholars that have come from different parts. He would request the Imam to attend. Imam Ali Salam would perform the wudu and would come to this area and would engage in discussions and debates with these people using their own language because the Imam Al Rida alayhi salam had knowledge of their languages. He would debate with them using their own books. He would discuss using the Torah, using the Injil. He would present them evidence from their own books. For instance, he would speak to atheists and those who disbelieved in the presence and in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of them would say, prove to me where is God and how is God? Imam al-Rida alayhi salam would respond to him and say, tell me where God is not and I'll tell you where God is. Likewise, he would say that Allah is the creator of space and time. He is not perceived by the senses. Nothing can be compared to him. You are, he would say to this individual, you are attributing human characteristics and attributes to God. 
God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. Someone comes and says to him, God is more than one. Imam Radha would say to him that you have acknowledged what? That there is one God. Why? Because the presence, the existence of one God is agreed upon. More than one God is a subject of disagreement. Therefore, we should stick to the area of agreement. And that is, there is one God. Different ways, just like how his fathers, Imam al-Sadiq salam, Imam al-Baqir, the Imam of Ahl al-Bayt salam would engage in the debate and discussion with others, giving profound answers and inspiring and influencing many. Using their own books, Imam al-Ridha, peace and blessings be upon him, also was emphatically powerful in refuting the misconceptions and the ideas that were spread by people of other faiths, such as Christianity and Judaism. For instance, in one of the debates that Imam Ridha alayhi salam had with a man by the name of Al-Jithliq, he was a Christian monk, and he came forward and he said to Imam Ridha, he said, Muslims and Christians all agree that Jesus is a man to be followed and to be respected. Therefore, we should stick to Jesus because we don't believe, according to Jithliq, the Christian says, we don't believe in your prophet, but you believe in our prophet. Therefore, we should all follow our prophet. At that moment, he would ask Imam al-Ridha and would say, what is your opinion about Isa and his books? Imam salam would say that I believe in Prophet Isa salam, who brought good tidings, glad tidings about the Holy Prophet and indeed his book, uh, the Injil, the words that, is pres that was truly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the distorted one. And he used to fast and pray, but the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam used to fast and pray more and had more knowledge. At that moment, the Jithliq becomes enraged and said, how could you say such a thing about Isa? How could you say that Prophet Muhammad, your Prophet, practiced fasting and prayed more than Jesus, our Lord? At that moment, Imam al-Ridha would ask a Jithliq, tell me, if you claim that he prayed and fasted more, who is he praying and fasting towards? if you consider him your Lord. What was the purpose of his praying and his fasting? Juthliq was left dumbfounded. He could not respond. Then he said, fine, but let's see this, that Isa salam used to bring the dead back to life. He used to cure the leopard. So he must be our Lord. Imam salam demonstrated his knowledge of the existence of the prophets and their miracles. He said, but al yasa also walked on water and Prophet Hizqil brought back thousands after 60 years that they had died. He brought them back. Other examples include Rasul Jalut, who is a Jewish rabbi. He would debate with Imam Ridha alayhi salam. Imam Ridha would say to him that you are refusing the prophethood of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for what reason? He says it's because we did not see it. We did not encounter it. Imam alayhi salam says, did you then see the miracles of Moses? Were you there? You have acknowledged his miracles. You have acknowledged his presence. Then why are you refusing the existence and the miracles of the Holy Prophet? And at the same time, Jesus. Isa alayhi salam. And this continued one after the other. Imam alayhi salam would find no match in his depth and knowledge and his extensive understanding of other faiths using their language and using their books. Every single scholar from different faiths who came to meet Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha left disappointed that he had not been able to defeat him but mesmerized by the knowledge of the grandson of the Holy Prophet. Of course, Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha debates were not only confined to people outside the religion of Islam, but there were those who were within the religion themselves, other sects, other denominations, other beliefs who had these types of ideas about the faith as well as clarifications that needed to be made. For instance, Al-Ma'mun himself one day asked Imam Ridha and said, 
How could you believe the narration which says Ali yun qasim al jannati wa nar It is Ali who divides and is the one who distinguishes from the people of going that go to Jannah and those who go to hell. Imam al Rida responded and said, "Do you not agree, and are you not aware of the tradition that states that states regarding Amir al Mu'minin?" Ya Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min wa la yubghidhuka illa munafiq. Oh Ali, the one who loves you is a believer and the one who hates you is a hypocrite. He says, yes. He says, this is exactly the understanding behind the division. Of course, as the interpretation of the narration is concerned by our scholars, and that is that whomsoever associates himself with Amir al muminin loves him and follows him will be of people of Jannah, and whomsoever opposes him and his teachings and does not follow him will be from the other side. Therefore, this was an example. Other examples included the debates regarding the Asma, the error-free, the sinless nature of the Holy Prophets that Imam al rida would undertake. People would ask him about Adam alayhi salam. How is it that the Quran said that Adam sinned? Wa'asa Adam rabbahu fagawa. How is it that he committed a sin? Imam alayhi salam would say, no, it was Jannah, it was a different realm. There were no sins there in, in that particular way. And therefore, when he came to earth, when he descended onto earth, that is, or, or anywhere outside the Jannah, that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically selected him and made this istifa process. Likewise, he would dispel any kind of notion of the mistake by Prophet Jonah, Yunus alayhi salam, by saying that he left quickly without waiting for the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him the go-ahead of leaving his community of Nainawa. He would dispel the story of Sulayma, of Dawood alayhi salam and that is found in the Israelite traditions of him falling in love with a lady that he saw from the top of his balcony or roof. He would say, he would be hurtful and say, this is very much against the special position enjoyed by the prophets of God and so on, this continues. That even when it comes to the Asma of our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam, he would speak about the idea of the marriage with Zainab bin Tijahsh. These debates are very important and can be found in books such as Bihar Al-Anwar and Uyun Akhbar Al-Ridha, which give us an indication of the depth and the length of time Imam Rada spent debating and dispelling the misconceptions and the ideas that had originated and had been gathered around different parts of the Muslim Ummah. Books have been written authors have compiled a number of achievements that Imam al-Rida established during the different phases of his illustrious life. We are told that he had an important responsibility and he fulfilled it brilliantly as far as dispelling the myths, the misconceptions, the wrong teachings of the different ideological groups and denominations that were rising at that time. And some of them were being promoted by the Abbasids and uh, what they wanted to establish for political reasons. And one of the establishments and the achievements of the Imam alayhi salam was regarding the need to stand up for justice and to fight oppression. Despite the fact that the Ahlul Bayt salam, were targeted, they were the recipients of much oppression, much hardship and difficulty. Imam al Rida alayhi salam, even when he was forced to become the heir apparent of Al Ma'mun al Abbasi, he would still defend justice. One day, we are told that there was a man who was a wayfarer, a Sufi, who was caught stealing and was brought to the courtyard of Al Ma'mun. Al Ma'mun wanted to punish him. When he saw him, he said to him, we know you as a worshipper of God, as an individual who has denounced this world. Why is it that you have stolen? He says to this wayfarer. This wayfarer said, 
that I have stolen because you have stolen. At that moment, Ma'mun becomes surprised. He says, how dare you accuse me, your leader, your governor, your caliph of stealing. He looked at Imam al-Rada, Ma'mun looked at Imam al-Rada and Imam al-Rada said, indeed, he has spoken the truth. Ma'mun expected Imam al-Rada to defend him. But Imam alayhi salam said the truth. Why? Because Ma'mun had usurped the wealth of the Muslims from Baytul Man, from the treasury. And this man, this individual had nothing to live upon. Therefore, he had to steal in order to survive. And at that moment, that individual, the wayfarer said to Ma'mun, he said to him, you belong to me. You are my servant and my slave. This further enraged Ma'mun. He said to him, how dare you accuse me of being your servant? That individual said, yes, you are my servant because your father Harun in Baghdad one day was playing a game with his wife Jamila. And he said to her that if I win this game of chess, then I will command you to do whatever you want, whatever I want. And if you win, you can command me to do whatever you want. And after humiliating her by asking that she walks around without any clothes in the palace, she wins the next game. And she says to him that you have to spend the night with a lady who is the ugliest in the palace and she is your mother. And she was a slave girl. And the slave girl was bought from the wealth belonging to Muslims and you were born from this. In other words, Ma'mun was born from this relationship. Therefore, because you were born from this relationship between your father Harun and the slave girl, then you belong to the Muslims. And therefore, you are an individual who belonged to me as a Muslim. Ma'mun was further enraged. He looked at Imam for support. Imam says, to Allah belongs the clear proof, the clear evidence, meaning that what this man has spoken is indeed the truth. Imam al Ridha was not afraid to speak the truth in the face of oppression and injustice. Two individuals would come to visit Imam al Ridha. They would say, Ibn Rasulullah, do we pray full or do we pray qasr? Half. Imam al Ridha would ask the first, What purpose has brought you here? He would say, O oh, the grandson of the Prophet, I've come to visit you. Then he'd ask the second. The second would say, I've come to visit Ma'mun. Imam would say to the first, you pray Qasr because you've come to visit me. Your visitation, your traveling is valid. Yet for the second, you have to pray full. Why? Because your journey is batil. You've come to see an oppressive, unjust ruler. And Imam السلام, spoke the truth. He was the crystallization of seeking justice as the Quran says that the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seek to establish adil and righteousness on this earth. Before reaching the city of Naysapur, narrations tell us that Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam reached this area here behind me. There he performed his prayers and whilst doing so he stood on a piece of rock. His footprints remained on that rock and today it, the area is referred to as Qadam Gah. The idea being is that people come to this area in order to acknowledge the fact that it is possible that the rock that is inside this building behind me contains the footprints of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. So they pray their prayers here and ask for the intercession of Imam alayhi salam. At the same time next to it, there is a well. The tradition and historical records tell us that Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam blessed this well, drank the water from this particular well. And people also do the same. They come to take part of this water due to its blessed nature as well as its barakah. From this area, Imam al Ridha alayhi salam moved on to the city of Naysapur. 
throughout the few years that the Imam alayhi salam was in the city of Merv in Khurasan, we are told that Ma'mun tried to somehow utilize the presence of the Imam for his own agenda. And one of those occasions was on the day of Eid, whereby Ma'mun had informed Imam al-Ridha that he should lead the prayers for Eid. Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam told him that he did not wish to do so, that this was not what he had come to do. Yet Al-Ma'mun insisted that Imam al-Ridha would lead the prayers for Eid. Imam al-Ridha said that if you are insisting, then what I will do is that I will perform Salatul Eid exactly how Prophet of Islam, my grandfather, as well as Amir al muminin peace be upon them, did so. So he performed the ghusl, the ritual uh, bath, and at the same time he wore clean clothes and he wore white turban and he walked barefooted. He started to recite the takbirat. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. When he started to do so, people around him started to do so. And the city itself was reverberating with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as mentioned by Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. At that moment, Ma'mun was told that if Imam al-Ridha would continue with this remembrance, that his power and grip over the Islamic Ummah would collapse. And Ma'mun sent a message to Imam al-Ridha saying him and asking him to return back and not to lead the Eid prayers. Ma'mun now realized that Imam al-Ridha, peace be upon him, and his influence had intensified and had grown in Khurasan. And therefore, the decision was made to assassinate him because in essence Ma'mun himself did not wish for Imam al-Ridha to grow in popularity but of course Imam al-Ridha himself was deeply influential he was very much inspirational for people and of course after the incident of the day of Eid whereby Ma'mun was told that Imam al-Ridha's popularity has shot up the decision was made. There were ministers and those around Ma'mun who had encouraged him to assassinate Imam al-Ridha. Therefore, he decided to do so. Narrations tell us that Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam was indeed assassinated by Ma'mun. But the way in which this happened is a matter of dispute in Islamic history. Some have suggested that grapes were poisoned and presented to Imam al-Ridha. Others say that some of the close associates of Ma'mun were told to immerse their hands in poison after prolonging their nails and thereafter extracting juice from pomegranates, the Roman, and presenting this to Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. Ma'mun did this and was very much tense. He outwardly expressed love to Imam al-Ridha, but indeed he was a hypocrite and wanted to get rid of the grandson of the Holy Prophet. What happened was that when Imam al-Ridha slowly began to drink the juice of the pomegranate, the impact of the poison began to be witnessed in his holy body. Ma'mun told him, drink more, O the grandson of the Holy Prophet. Yet Imam would drink only a little and then would look at Ma'mun and say, what you wanted to achieve has indeed materialized. Imam Salamullahi Alayhi knew exactly that he would be martyred before all this, because he would say that it, it would be in this place that I would be buried in Tus, in Khurasan. In terms of the burial place of Imam al-Rida Alayhi Salam, this was identified by him, of course, a while back before his martyrdom. 
the house that belonged to a man by the name of Humayd ibn Qahtaba. There were common well-known traditions at that time because Dhul Qarnayn, who is said to be Cyrus the Great, had seen a dream that the representative of God will be buried on this land. And therefore, what happened was that Harun al-Abbasi thought that he would be buried here. When he was buried in the house of Humayd ibn Qahtaba, Imam al-Rada would say that I would be buried there. Certain individuals would say never, that this cannot happen. And even afterwards, they said that Imam al-Rida would be buried at the feet of Harun. Yet Imam salam said, never will this occur, that Harun will be at the feet of Imam al-Rida salam. Later, after the martyrdom of Imam al-Rida, peace and blessings be upon him, there was a procession that people in this particular area, in Tus, in Maaf Khurasan had staged this funeral. Many were weeping and crying. The whole city was in mourning. Ma'mun al-Abbasi, of course, had staged this fake funeral process. And he followed the janaza, the body, the holy body of Imam al-Rida to its resting place. What had happened, of course, was that Miraculously, the son of Imam al rida Imam Muhammad al-Jawad salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, came all the way from Medina. He himself performed the salah over the body of the Imam, whilst many had not recognized him. And it was he, Imam al-Jawad, who placed the body in its position because the body of the Imam has to be buried by an Imam. Imam al-Rida was buried exactly where he had said that he would be buried, despite the efforts of certain individuals for this not to happen. And his shrine today constitutes a place whereby millions visit throughout the year, paying their respects and standing in solidarity, acknowledging the great legacy and the many lessons to be learned from the holy eighth beacon of light, from the ship of salvation, the ship of the Ahl al-Bayt, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. There are abundant narrations found in the books of Hadith that encourage believers from across the world to make the journey and to perform the ziyara, the visitation of the shrine of the Holy Eighth Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Indeed, the emphasis is great. Imam al-Rida alayhi salam is known as Gharib al gharaba the one who is buried by himself, away from the rest of the Imams. And the Imams themselves would encourage the people to make the journey due to the immense rewards and the great opportunities to obtain the blessings and the shafa'ah as well as the tawassul of the Imam, peace and blessings be upon him. In, for instance, the famous book, Ayunu Akhbar al-Rida, we find a narration from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which states, Satutfanu bid'atun minni bu Khurasan, that a part of me shall be buried in the land of Khurasan. Ma zaraha makroobun illa rafa'allahu karbah. Whomsoever has anguish or difficulty and goes to visit this individual, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove that difficulty. And anyone who is a sinner who visits Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove their sins due to the blessings of the visitation, if performed correctly, of course. We find there is a famous narration regarding Imam al Rida alayhi salam whom he says, Man zarani ala dari, whomsoever visits me, despite the fact that I'm far, on the day of judgment, I shall come to him in three places. First of all, when the book is given to the human being, whether they are, whether it is given on the right or to the left. Secondly, at the bridge, and the surat, and thirdly, and the mizan. In other words, 
when the scale and the balance is placed between the good deeds and the bad deeds. Imam al-Ridha in this narration states that whomsoever visits him, he will come to assist them and help them. Likewise, you find that he himself in the same book, Ayunu Akbar al-Ridha says, هذه البقعة روضة من رياض الجنة that this land, in other words, the land of Tus, where Imam al-Ridha is buried, is part of paradise. Where the angels descend continuously until the trumpet is blown. So many such narrations that whomsoever visits Imam al-Ridha, peace and blessings be upon him, it is as if they have visited Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his throne metaphorically. Meaning that this area is enshrouded and encapsulated with mercy and forgiveness and the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards those who go there with a heart full of submission, with a heart seeking to attach themselves to the great Imam and to obtain his intercession. Millions of people make the journey to the wonderful shrine and the many courtyards of Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, peace and blessings be upon him, throughout the year. Many of them come anticipating this special atmosphere and truly they do not leave disappointed. Many people will narrate a story or two about the greatness of the visitation towards the shrine of Imam al-Ridha These are known as karamat, special blessings. People have been cured, others have been guided and inspired. There is a special section at the shrine itself whereby these miracles are recorded and documented. Within the shrine itself, there is this particular section which documents these stories. And of course, these miracles are not just contemporary, but they had been witnessed throughout the times. Some are recorded in the book Uyunu Akhbar al-Ridha by Sheikh al-Saduq Radwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. One story found in the book Uyunu Akhbar al-Ridha is from a man by the name of Al-Dabbi. Of course, Sheikh al-Saduq narrates this, that this man was truly an individual who hated the Ahlul Bayt. He says that I did not find anyone more hating of the Ahlul Bayt than this person. To the extent that when they recite the Salawat, they stop at Allahumma salli ala Muhammad and they would not mention the family, the progeny. This man himself states that I was given and entrusted with a certain amount of money. I placed it somewhere and later on I forgot where I had placed it. And the person who came back and wanting it requested it from me. I did not know where it was. I was stuck. I saw a group of individuals walking towards the shrine of Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha. I was in desperation. I went there. I prayed to God using this holy individual. Later that night in my dream, a man came to me who was illuminating and pointed me towards an area and said, this is where the money that has been entrusted to you can be found. When I woke up, I did not believe my dream. Yet I told this individual just simply to give him hope. Later, this man returned and said, yes, I found what I had entrusted upon you in that area. From that moment, this individual became a lover of Imam al-Ridha and called for people to visit him. Another story is told in the same book, Ayyuna Akhbar al-Ridha by a Sheikh al-Saduq, whereby one day an individual came with his slave. They made a sajda, they prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala close to the shrine and the mausoleum, the dhariyah of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. The servant was a few meters away. The master was a few meters ahead. In sajda, they were both praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the master lifted his head, he looked at the servant and said, come towards me. The servant came towards him. He said to him, do you wish to be free? He said, yes. He said, then I free you for the sake of Allah and I will marry you to one of my servants and I will look after the dowry and whatever is required for you to get married. The servant broke down in tears and said, by God, this is what I had just requested when I was in sajda here next to the shrine and the dhariyah of Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha. 
Indeed, we are not surprised by the countless accounts and narrations found about the barakah and the fact that the hajat of people are fulfilled and their supplications are answered in the shrine of the eighth holy Imam, the grandson of the holy prophet, peace and blessings be upon them all. Those who seek the Ahlul Bayt and want to be illuminated by them and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through them, through tawassul which has been mentioned in the Quran and is legislated and practiced and encouraged by Muslims throughout generations. Indeed, it is one that highlights the importance of these holy individuals and the visitations to their shrines.